there, welcome back to Seaport Vault. My name is Sarah Augustine, and don't mind me, I'm just trying on my diving shoes here, because today's topic for the video is diving in the Delaware River. Now, if I can stand up in these shoes, let's get started. All right, so here I would ask the question, what is diving? But I think we all have a general concept of what diving is. It's going underwater for the sake of performing a task. But what would you do with diving? What are those tasks that you would do? So diving would traditionally be utilized to retrieve cargoes or other valuables that had fallen into the water. It would be utilized to investigate shipwrecks. It would be utilized to actually clear out some of the rubble from shipwrecks. And it would also be utilized to create infrastructure. So bridges, widening roadways, creating piers, all of that good stuff. And it will be used by both the Navy and general civilians for the sake of accomplishing all of those things. Now, the diving dress is very, very specific, and we're gonna head to the vault right now to go investigate that. All right, so here we are down in the seaport vault with the standard diving dress. It's also known as copper hat or hard hat or even heavy equipment. Standard diving gear is very, very specific, as I said in the other room. And as you can see behind me, it is really, really big. And it's really, really heavy. You can take that from me because Craig and I, our curator, had to shift this all the way into the middle of the floor for the sake of filming today. Now, it's heavy for a reason, though. It's not just for fun, not just to make us curators and archivists have a little bit of an issue when we're looking back at it historically. But when you're down diving, you need air. So the air supply would have been pumped into that suit using tubes. Now, when you pump air into something, it kind of fills up like a balloon. And while you need to breathe, you also don't need to be bobbing around like a balloon when you're in the water. So therefore, in addition to the really heavy equipment, just it's made out of good material and it's well made, they also had to add some weights to make sure that you weren't just bobbing around to keep you planted firmly at the river's bottom. The allure of diving has pretty much been around since the dawn of humanity, but it was really only in like the 1820s that we started to really see the standard diving dress be created. The diving helmet was first patented in England by John and Charles Dean in the 1820s, and that was based off of a helmet that was patented for firemen. So kind of the same concept, having something on the outside that you don't want in blocked off so you're able to have kind of a natural, human-worthy environment on the inside. So putting on this whole ensemble is really, really arduous, and it actually takes a few people to help you get into it. You can't just pop it on and expect to go down. Uh, the process of getting dressed is called dressing in, so you're really kind of getting into it, and then you're going to be encapsulated in this whole big suit. The first step of dressing in is putting on the suit itself. So that's this long kind of bodysuit that's made out of canvas that you see here. And this is really where your air supply would be. It's pumped in, and we'll get to that in just a moment, by the air tubes, and that is what is filling up, and that is what you are wearing pretty much from neck to your ankles. You can think of it as coveralls that you might wear when it's snowy out, or like those Carhartt Michelin Man kind of suits that you wear in the winter time. The next step of dressing in is putting on the corslet. No, I did not say corset. I said corslet, which is this nice little breast piece, a neck piece, if you will, that the helmet would later be attached to. So this is metal, sometimes copper, and it would be placed over the head with a nice little head hole, covering just like this and resting on your shoulders to support the weight of that very heavy helmet. The next step would be putting on those shoes. And as you saw me struggling a little bit in the beginning of this video, those also are very heavy for a purpose. The soles of the shoes would have been made out of steel to help keep your feet firmly planted on the bottom of the ocean or river or whatever body of water you were diving in. And as you can see, while these are made of leather, some are made of canvas, but they kind of look like Converse sneakers, as you can see in the comparison. So they are steel tipped so you don't stub your toe on anything, and that steel tip is attached to that sole. The next step of dressing in is putting on your weights. Now this is a weight belt that you see here, and it is a leather belt with little holes cut into them. And these lead weights would be attached to the belt, 
the belt will be put on in order to keep you weighted. It adds a little bit of extra weight that the rest of the suit cannot provide. And that is just kind of your assurance that you will stay grounded at the bottom of the river, ocean, whatever body of water to make sure again that you're not floating around. This particular weight belt has a little bit of a suspender thing going on and that's just to make sure that it doesn't slip off of you and it helps everything stay nice and snug and stable. Now lead is also what's used in fishing for sinkers so you can kind of apply that same concept here where it's a very very dense very heavy piece of equipment that is helping us stay at the bottom. The final step of dressing in is of course putting on the helmet. Now the helmet is kind of of a fishbowl shape as you can see up here. It would be made out of copper and it would be attached to the corslet that we put on a little bit earlier. So it screws on with a couple of clicks so it is very airtight and at this point that air tube would be connected to the back of the helmet through its nice little porthole so the air is pumping in as soon as that helmet is on the diver. There are windows that you can look out of so you can kind of see where you're at, but when you're underwater, how much you can see really depends on how clear the water is. You could see well, you could have things be a little murky, or you could have little to no visibility at all. Now before you send your diver down, you could open this porthole, check to make sure everything's okay. Oh, it looks a little creepy. So we could tuck him back in and send him on his way. And screw it back together and now everything is airtight the air is being pumped in and you're ready to go all right so you've been hearing me talk a lot about the tubes so let's look into the tubes shall we this first tube that's a little bit thicker is that air tube so it's got this little spigot on it and you'd be able to screw it onto the back of the helmet to supply all of the air for the diver. This other thinner tube actually has an electrical mount for it and this would be your telecommunications. So this will be screwed in and it would be attached to a hydrophone which we'll talk about in just a moment. Now these tubes, so you don't get all tangled up, would be tied together and you can see the tie is still intact here. Now, once you're all dressed in and you're ready to go down, they help you into the water, you get down to the bottom of the river, and you're just, you know, you're picking around, you're doing what divers do, and your head itches, or you have to sneeze, or, oh, your sock is slipping down just a little bit. You can't really adjust things, can you? You're all strapped into the suit. So really, you have to have a lot of self-control, and you have to be okay with being a little bit uncomfortable with, when you're a diver. Now something else that happened is you're down at the bottom of the river and you start to feel a creepy crawly little thing up your leg. Yes, there are some cases where cockroaches would make their way into these suits. Nobody knows about it. You get underwater and all of a sudden they wake up and decide it's playtime. Let's move on, shall we? Well, I think the thought is enough. So diving is really not a one man job. On average, there would be about five people on the diving team to help the one diver with his activities. So there needs to be someone spotting, there needs to be someone to help you get dressed in, there need to be people to work those air pumps, and it's really not just something that you can drop everything and just go do by yourself. And with that, we've been talking so much about how heavy this suit is, once you're in it, you can't really move around. I mean, those shoes are heavy, that belt is heavy, everything is probably gonna be more than you even weigh. So you're, if you try to move, you're just kinda gonna go like this. And that'll take a lot of time for you to get over to the ladder to get down into the water. So with that, there would be sort of a hoist system or just the men on the team would help you get to the edge of the barge or the pier that you were on, and they would help you into the water. And then once you're in the water, as you know from swimming or anything like that, things get a little bit easier to move. So heavy things become lighter, and once you're in the water, you're able to be a little bit more self-sufficient. Now that we've learned a little bit about the diving equipment, let's head upstairs to the research center to meet our diving friend, Herman Walter. So it can be easy to think of diving as just being water and heavy equipment and found treasures. Let's take a pause to really look into the human aspect of it that really makes diving diving. Hermann Walter was born in 1839 in Prussia, part of what's today considered Poland, and during the American Civil War, when he was aboard an American merchant vessel, 
towards India, he was actually captured by Confederate forces. He was sent to Baltimore, Maryland to be imprisoned, and upon his release, he immediately joined the Union Navy. And he stayed within the Navy until the end of the war. And he even fought in battles, including the Second Battle of Fort Sumter. After the war, he settled in Philadelphia, and that's really where our story truly gets started. So once he got to Philadelphia, what did he do? Well, he was a diver. As a diver, his main job was to assist with raising boats, ships, and other items that had fallen into the water. There's even a story of when a safe had fallen off of a ferry into the river that he and his team successfully brought up from the bottom. He was responsible for the diving work associated with the widening of Delaware Avenue in 1898 and 1899, which was a really big deal. And he also was responsible for the diving that was associated with building the Penrose Ferry Bridge as well as the Girard Avenue Bridge. So beyond all of this work, he was also frequently engaged by fortune hunters. In 1899, he was engaged by a group of spiritualists who had revealed in a seance from Captain Kidd that there was a whole bunch of gold at the bottom of the Delaware River up by Andalusia House. So they engaged Herman to help them find that gold. Herman was sworn to secrecy and he and his crew gave it about three days before they just kind of gave up on it. I guess the gold wasn't there. But you know, I'm kind of curious about it. Captain Kidd, if you're here and can tell me where that gold is, knock three times. Herman was frequently in the newspapers and was really an esteemed member of Philadelphia society. Even though he wasn't one of those highfalutin people, he was still a really, really um, respected and admired person in the community. He was very proud of his own business achievements and his achievements as a diver on a very personal level. And there's even a life-size sculpture of him in his diving gear where his grave is today. Let's go down to the vault to learn a little bit more about diving. Hey, Sarah, did you hear about the deep sea diver who had to quit his job? He couldn't handle the pressure. Do you get it? He couldn't handle the pressure. All right, now I know why that diving instructor quit because that's a lot of pressure to follow up on, but we're gonna try. So here we are back at our favorite place, the vault, the Seaport Vault. And we're gonna be looking a little bit deeper into some of the items that we have been talking about earlier. And first of all, we're gonna be inspecting this air pump. Now this is a little bit smaller of a version than what would be typically used for deeper diving, but we're still gonna investigate it because it's really nice looking, don't you think? So this is a single crank air pump and it would be one person stationed here cranking this air pump while the diver was underwater. So you can see this wheel over here could also be utilized um, to help crank it. And then this is the little air pump down here. So the hose will be connected to this and then that hose again connected to the diver. All right, so when you're all in your diving suit, the outside world is really kind of disconnected from you. So when you're speaking, nobody can hear you. And when people are speaking around you, unless you can see their lips moving, you're not really aware of what's going on. So there was an invention that was created to get around this, and that was called the hydrophone. So we have telephones. We know telephones have been around since the early 1900s, but this one was specifically designed for use underwater. So when you're underwater, sound travels 4.3 times faster than it does when you're on land. And to get around that sound impedance, this was created to specially adapt to the acoustics of the water. Now this box would have two cables attached to these little um, inputs here. One would be connected to a person on the barge or on the pier where the diver was diving off of. And then the other would be connected to the diving suit so that they could communicate back and forth. Now the diver would be wearing something that looks like this. And as you can see, it kind of looks like the headphones that we would have today. So it would be strapped onto the head, one earpiece, so they can hear what's going on. And then there would also be a microphone output for them to speak to the people up above. Now it made them less reliant on the rope signals that were used since diving was pretty much invented, but they still did use those rope signals just in case there was a technology malfunction. All right, so diving equipment tends to be very heavy, so I have my handy dandy helper Alexis here to help me out with this piece. So this is a shallow diving helmet, 
and you can see it looks a little bit different than the deep dive helmet that we were showing earlier, and that is because the corslet is actually attached to it, so it's one long piece, and it's also not quite as fishbowl shaped, if you will, as the deep dive helmet. So this is, again, one single piece. It would still be connected to an air tube, but it's for more of a shallower diving environment. Okay, so when you're underwater and you have to collect smaller items that might not be lifted up with a winch, you would be using a diving bag such as this. So it might not be as convenient for you to have a bucket or even a wire basket, but this container here is made out of canvas, the same material that your diving suit will be made out of. So it is nice, compactable, you can fold it up if you need to, but it opens up and you can store a whole bunch of things. As you can see, it's pretty deep. And then as you're coming up, it can just be hooked under your arm and you are all set to go. Now, a cool feature of this are the grommeted holes that are in this bag. So that is to allow the water to rush out as you raise yourself up to the surface. And that way you're not bringing up a whole bucket full of water. You have a whole bucket full of artifacts. We're just about at the end of the video, but wait, I've been talking about diving this whole time and I've yet to call it scuba diving. Why is that? Well, diving and scuba diving are two different things. Scuba diving is a post-World War II development, and it was actually patented in 1952 with the Aqualung. So scuba stands for self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. Yes, scuba is an acronym. So just as its name suggests, it is completely independent. So the air supply is not reliant on somebody above the water's surface. It is that typical tube that you see on a diver's back. It's just strapped on and you can go down and just go about. So with scuba diving, we get some other items that we typically think of when we think of diving in a modern sense. So we have the snorkel and we also have the flipper. Now, our diver back in the beginning of this video did not have a shoe that looks like this. And that's because being weighted down to the bottom of the, the ocean or river or other body of water's floor is not really as important. You can of course walk around if you need to, but you're not gonna be filled up like a balloon with that whole big breathing tube thing. You're actually gonna be able to just have it kind of fished into your mouth a little bit, so you're getting that direct breathing. You're not reliant on a whole environment happening. So since we're not blown up like a balloon, we're able to be a little bit more independently mobile, and also we don't have to worry about having all of that heavy equipment. The equipment is still heavy, still very specialized, but again, it's leaving room for more of an independently mobile situation. And that is what we typically associate with diving today. So with this increased self-reliance and independence, it really has become pretty accessible to the masses, if you will. So while there still is some training that needs to be involved, we're starting to see it more and more with a tourist type setting or an excursion type setting. And even with professionals, we're still getting a lot more underwater photography and film. And it's just opening up worlds that we typically didn't see 200 or even 300 years ago. Thank you so much for taking the time to take this little deep dive into diving with me today. I hope you'll join us next time as we uncover more from the Seaport Vault. And until next time, I'm going to go out and fill up my diving bag with some goodies for our next adventure. Thank you so much.